Hey guys, welcome back to C++. My name is <coughs> Mr. Magic, and this is part four in the series. So today we're going to talk about how C++ works, how does it compile, and then how does it actually run on a computer and on a phone or on Xbox, all of those. So first thing we need to do is we can open up our project file, which is a .sublime-workspace file. So you can right click it, open with sublime text. Now, so far, if you have anything inside the source file while we're setting up, just delete it. And inside the include folder, you can just delete all that. We're gonna start fresh, control N. All right, we're gonna start with a hashtag. So everything that has a hashtag is a preprocessor statement, meaning this happens before our compilation. There's a few different steps to go through. First, let's just write a simple hello world. So hashtag include. So include is essentially gathering the tools we need. It's importing libraries. And in this case, we only have one which is iostream. So iostream is a library that we can use to print stuff to the console. One more thing to note, we do want to set our project, set, uh, go to tools, build system, set that one to uh, debug. Don't go with release because we're not going to be releasing. 95% of the time, you're going to be going with debug because that's how you debug your code. Now, this only really applies to sublime text, but it won't highlight the code the way you want it until you save the file. So I always save my files first. Where you save this does matter. In my case, I like to have a folder called dev, stands for development, and it's tied there. I've got tutorials, teaching C++, and right inside there I've got source. So SSD stands for source. This is where our C++ source files go, and usually they're named all little case when you go with source files. Now, don't get me wrong, you will see some people who they'll actually go like a capital M there. <sighs> The computer honestly doesn't care as long as if you have names that are valid. As long as the names match up and you know what you're using, the computer doesn't care. So we have this freedom and it's a freedom you can use to keep things straightforward. So this way you always know, a lot of case means it's a source file. Right, so now it should highlight this. I, I might change that color scheme. Where was my good old classic? What happened? Oh. Okay, here we go. Yeah, this was the color scheme I got, had set up. Whew, that other one, my goodness. I don't know if it's you guys do this, but when I code, I usually like change the color scheme every now and then. Once a month, I'll just change up the color scheme just to keep things fresh. I don't know. Maybe I'm weird. Well, I am weird, so I'm a nerd. All right, so this is a preprocessor statement. We gathered the tools we need to print out Hello World. I'm gonna move it along and go int main. Now you want to open and close some parentheses and then you want to open and close some curly braces so it really depends you can have your curly brace right there totally fine a lot of this is up to you so you got to make up your mind as you go along how do you want to program i used to do this but i find my programming style kind of changes over the years and now i do this so it's really up to you right so we got a few things going on here you can only have one main function and this is a function so this is a special case function it returns an integer but since it's named main, the compiler says, okay, this is where the program starts. The computer always starts at main. All right, parentheses are the parameters we can pass to it. So we can actually give it some variables here. So next is the curly braces. So the curly braces is the scope of this function, right? Begin the scope, end the scope. Pretty straightforward. Everything inside here is inside the main function. Next, we're gonna add a line, std colon colon c out space two angular brackets and then open up some quotes. So the quotes is a string. You can really say whatever you want. Everybody does hello world. Ugh, so unoriginal. We gotta be a little creative here. So we can say, uh, scoop d do, scoop to do. All right, two more angular brackets and then std colon colon and l. All right, now if you just do this by itself, it'll actually close out really fast. We won't even be able to see it. So this prints it. We gotta make sure, we gotta make the console just hold on a second. To do that, we go std colon colon cn dot get. Now this is a method, part of the cn class. So because it is a method, that's why we got these two parentheses. And that line with the semicolon, control save, and now you should be able to run it. Looking good. Now if you're on Linux, it'll actually by default just print everything to right here while my mouse is pointing. If you just go project, edit project, right where we run it, you can just add this right here. You can add GNOME terminal. All right, so this line prints, and this line says, hold on a second, wait until I press enter before I close. It's kind of unfortunate, I think, that it's written this way. Something as simple as just printing something is written this way in C++. I say that because this kind of stuff like that, it's not very common. You don't see a lot of this. You only really see that when you're printing. Mamma mia. So we can actually replace this mess by using something called a hash divine. So hash define... So what hashtag does is it looks for anything in our code. It looks for a specific word. 
In our case, we'll just look for print because print's pr fairly easy. And we'll take a variable as a parameter. So message, it does not really matter. You don't have to declare which type. And then we can go std colon colon c out and then print our message and then end the line with std colon colon end out. So with this hash defined in effect, we can take out this line and just replace it with print. And then we can really say whatever we want. Let's just go with scoop, scoop to do. Control save, that will work just fine like that. As you see, we got scoop de doo So this is a preprocessor statement. What it does is hash defines, they look inside our code for this print. So it goes, aha. And what it does is it just essentially auto replaces this code with this. So here we've got a basic program. Let's break it down into the actual steps. First step, pre-processing. First thing we do is we go hashtag include is we get our libraries, we get our tools ready. These tools can also be our own thing. So example, if we had a player, we'd go include player.hpp, right? These libraries can be our own libraries or it can be external libraries like Vulkan or OpenGL, DirectX, you know, one of those. In the pre-processing step, it just goes through this deals with the hash defines and hash includes. The second step is the compiling step. So in this, we take our C++ code and turns it into assembly code. Assembly is another computer programming language. And that leads us to the third step, which is actually assembly. So then it takes that assembler code and brings it down to ones and zeros. So this is where we actually get it to machine code that we can actually use. And then there's one last step and that's linking. So how does linking work? You may say, well, it's basically like this. We don't want all of our code in the same file because, because that just gets messy. So if we have a different file and it has a super highly classified function, such as adding revolutionary. We need a way to actually bind these two files together. Another great example is how exactly, uh, how exactly do we get to this iOS stream? Where does it come from? That's what linking does. It takes the compiled files of external libraries, binds it into our code and binds all of our code together. It kind of just glues everything together. And that produces an executable, which on Windows, well, if we go into bin and debug, on Windows, it'll be called a .exe file. On Mac, it's a .app file. And on Linux, it's just a file. It doesn't really matter. And we can actually open this and we can see we got some pretty interesting stuff. This is hex. We're just reading binary as hex, which the hexadecimal system is a way of reading binary. All right. So but by the time it gets here, C++ is no longer required to run this program. So that means we could take this main.exe, which I'll open in folder. We can take this main executable, bring it to a different computer. We can sell it. If it's a game, we can publish it, all sorts of things. All right. So that's how we get to this file now. How does this file actually run on our computer? And that is an incredible question. I'm glad you asked. So here's a basic diagram of a computer. We can see here we got our HHD slash SSD. This is actually where our main file is stored right now. Right now, this is on our hard drive. So it will usually be a hyper hard drive or an SSD. SSDs are better because they're faster, so. But anyway, so this is where we actually store our entire game. So we ship that, the user installs the game onto his computer, and then it just sits there when it's not being used on the SSD or HHD. All right, so when we run our executable, when we double click on it and open up our game, we actually load our executable into RAM. And what RAM is, is it's basically your, your hard drive just faster, right? It's this memory that's not permanent or anything. It's just loaded there temporarily for when we're running programs. All right, so here we got our motherboard or as they would say in the PC builder groups, the MOBO. It does sound cooler though. This is where everything ties together. It's kind of just like the, it's like, it's like the nest where all the chickens huddle in. It just binds the computer together. You got your CPU. This is the central processing unit. So it's essentially the brain of the computer. It handles calculations such as math and it handles memory calculations such as where, where to allocate memory, things like that. We got our graphics card. You'll notice that I did not say GPU. It doesn't really matter to me what people call it. It's just I'm going to differentiate because the graphics card has GPUs on it and it also has VRAM and a variety of other components. We're just going to talk about VRAM and the GPU on it. So the VRAM is essentially RAM just on your graphics card and the GPU is a CPU on your graphics card. So the GPU on the graphics card performs calculations at such as where to array these pixels on the screen. And then the VRAM is where we can actually load textures and save the textures onto the VRAM temporarily just while we're running them. Next, we got our sound card, which is so we can load our sounds from our game, such as the sound.mp3 file, and we can convert it into a analog format and then play it into our speakers. All right, so the first thing that happens when you run your application 
is this application loads up into your RAM and it is now stored in your memory. So once it's loaded into memory, you could just delete it off your hard drive and it would still keep running. It doesn't really need it once it's loaded into RAM. Now, I just wanna say not all parts of your main application will load into RAM and that's because your RAM has a lot less memory than your hard drive does. So you don't wanna load, like you don't wanna load everything if you have a ginormous code. If you have a ginormous game and you're not using a section of the code, just keep that on the hard drive till you need it. You can always load it later, but for the most case and for this example, we're just going to pretend it all loads up to the RAM. Then we can begin telling our CPU to begin executing commands. So just add these two integers, performs memory calculations. Ah, killed it. There we go. The end of an app. That little rascal is being a pest. Now for game has textures, those will load typically to the VRAM over in the graphics card. So we'll go through the pipe onto our mobile and then we'll go down into our graphics card. And then that texture will stay on the VRAM, which is video RAM. Now the video RAM can get too full sometimes because that's limited too. So if that is too full, some textures will, will instead load over to the RAM. But for the most part, it loads to the VRAM. Now with sound files, it gets a little complicated. Usually you'll only load a sound file when you actually need it. If it's a small sound file, like a step, like you're just walking, you'll probably just load that up as the game's running because it's a pretty small thing. It's not gonna take a whole lot of RAM. You get long pieces of music, however, you won't wanna load everything right into your RAM off the bat. They'll just choke your RAM for no reason if you're not using them. All right, so some of this stays on the hard drive. Some of it loads into RAM but it goes to the motherboard and then into the sound card. And then finally out into the speakers, we actually hear it. Same with the texture. Now in the graphics card, we can actually load code from our executable into the GPU. That's something called a shader. And then from that shader, we can do mathematical operations and stuff to have different effects. So then we apply our calculations and our GPU calculations and shaders to this texture. And then we go bloop down the pipe. And then we finally see it on screen, depending on where it is on the screen that all gets determined in the computer. So that's essentially it. I know it's not everything, but I don't really have time to explain every little bit of a computer. So if you're wondering, well, how does a phone work? How does the Xbox work? How about PlayStation? They all work the same. PlayStation and, and a PC work essentially the same way. Same thing with a phone. Alrighty, so I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. So all right, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed, code like. If you have a question, just let me know in the comments section and I will see you next video.